Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Williams, and we're here to help you make the most of your minerals and royalties. And in this episode, we're going to talk about a scam or uh, unscrupulous business practices that a particular landman has been preying upon unsuspecting mineral and royalty owners. And so this is an urgent alert of this particular situation in hopes to prevent others from getting taken advantage of by this uh, individual or by others that are taking similar approach to acquiring minerals and royalties and not being upfront with the mineral and royalty owners. So Justin, this particular issue, we talked before we uh, hit record that we've talked about other scams and other methods that some unscrupulous folks have used to take advantage of mineral and royalty owners in the past. And this one is a new one for me. Yeah, man, it, it's an interesting one. And it's, it's really preying on the complexity of the oil and gas legal world and using an instrument that may have a valid purpose for an invalid um, reason. And, and, you know, it, it really comes off as deceit. So this is an interesting one. You know, Matt, as you mentioned, this game's kind of been going around. The It's a term royalty deed is how it's titled. So, so yeah, like just to mention, the scam that has um, been going on in several states where we've seen these instruments get recorded or where property owners have brought it up to my colleagues is something that's sort of widespread. And it seems to be centered around Oklahoma and Texas right now. But if you've received one of these letters and one of these offers, you know, reach out to us and we'll put it on the radar and so that we can help potentially nip this in the bud and get some legislation going to help protect mineral and royalty owners. But in the meantime, what is going on is there's an unscrupulous landman that is acquiring what appears to be term royalty and basically that term royalty deed, which is not title to term royalty deed. It's the term royalty assignment. And I think they're doing that to try to get around some of the requirements within Texas property code. But when you read it, it says on top, it's a one-year term royalty assignment. But when you read the language in the instrument, the term is actually somewhat uh, longer than that. In fact, as long as oil and gas is produced from any existing or future wells. And so in that particular assignment, The uh, property owners think they're reserving the interest to an existing vertical well, let's say. And so that's spelled out in the assignment itself. But then when you read the the language in the deed, it's actually as long as any oil and gas is produced from those accepted wells or any future well. And in almost every case, it seems like there are new wells that have just been drilled or there are ducts, in other words, drilled and uncompleted wells. And so if the property owner would have known this, they probably wouldn't have assigned this document because they would have been receiving a big bump in their royalty payments from all these new wells that are coming online. But instead, they're assigning their interest over to this person for a a fraction of what they would have received had they just held on to the interest. And so, you know, the net result, Justin, is that royalty owners think they're only giving up one year of potential payments from any other wells that aren't reserved by them. And in that deed. But in fact, what they're actually doing is giving up all future payments, again, for just a fraction of what they had, would have gotten if they had just held on to it. So before we dive in, Justin, to the details of this scam and talk about what these instruments say, let's talk about a few important terms. I think it's important to understand what a term royalty deed is. Do you want to go over that first? Let's do it, ma'am. So first, it's important, and we've talked about this a lot, about the bundle of sticks. And in other words, that's the property rights associated with the mineral estate. Um, they break down. There's five key rights associated with the mineral interests, and that's a right to drill a well. Uh, most mineral owners transfer this right to an operator through the oil and gas lease um, rather than do that themselves. Executive rights, um, the right to sign an oil and gas lease, delay rentals, which is an older concept whereby the lease would terminate at the end of each year during the primary term unless the lessee either commences operation or um, pays the lessor a delayed rental. Today's oil and gas leases are usually what's called paid up, meaning that all the rental payments for the duration of the primary term are paid up front and in the form of a lease bonus payment. Uh, There's the bonus payments, which is the right to receive that lease bonus payment 
when the mineral rights are leased. And then last but not least, royalties, which is the right to receive a royalty payment on the production and sell of any minerals such as oil and gas that's produced from the lands. And Matt, there is an interesting feature with the royalty right in that uh, you can convey or transfer some or all of your right to receive royalties. Um, and, and I have some NPRI rights, and that's one way uh, that this can be done. And it's called a non-participating royalty interest. And that allows the owner of their mineral estate to retain the executive rights to sign a lease and receive the bonus and the delayed rental payments associated with that lease while transferring a portion of their right to receive royalties to somebody else. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I've seen those a lot of times where maybe somebody needs some cash up front. They want to sell a, a small stake in their, in their royalty interest and basically will grant a non-participating royalty interest to that other party. And that NPRI typically is a perpetual right. And so it's something that wouldn't expire and can be conveyed even if there are no wells that have been drilled yet. So it's it's definitely something that can be a useful tool. I also own some non-participating royalty interests and they've been very uh, beneficial. And you know the thing that is interesting when you talk about a term royalty deed, what that means, you're basically only conveying the royalty rights to the described property for a specific period of time, which is the term. And so it could be a year, or it could be based on a certain amount of revenue or royalties that have been received up to a certain amount. And I know, Justin, you've dealt with this in the past with your great uncle, and you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is a, a use of this instrument that uh, is really what it's intended for. And so he would loan money, or I assume this, I don't have a history, um, money would be loaned um, and then it would be paid back by that term royalty deed, um, specifying how much money was loaned, how much is to be repaid. Um, and then at times he would reserve a piece or part of that, but it was all laid out clearly on um, both timeline amounts in that contract. And, and Matt, that's a, a, a common use of this instrument that you see, but it's certainly not the same as the scam that we're talking about. Yeah. And you know, at face value, we will have to say term royalty deed in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Again, it's just when you think you're signing a term royalty deed for a very small period of time, when in fact it's being held for decades, probably until, you know, production ceases from any of those existing or future wells. So in fact, it's a perpetual conveyance when you think you're only conveying a year, which is the problem here. And and the you know potential situation where a mineral or royalty owner could be swindled out of the value associated with their interests without realizing it until it's too late. For example, I think that you know there are some benefits to that term deed. If you want to let's say, convey a wellbore only interest for a certain period of time. So let's say you have some new wells that were just drilled and you need some cash, but you want to hold on to your mineral rights because there's a potential for many more wells to get drilled in the future and you want to take advantage of that upside potential. Well, you could sell a wellbore only interest in those existing wells through a term royalty deed, and it could be for a specific period of time. Maybe it's you know, five years or 10 years. And so that's something where it's like an annuity. So the person that's buying this is getting a defined income stream into the future. They can pay for based on a little bit of a discount up front because you're giving them a, a lump sum of cash, you know, the person to the person that owns that royalty interest. And if it's done in an upfront manner, it can be a great way to generate some cash while maintaining some of your existing rights. And so you know, in and of itself, it's not a bad thing. I think the thing that is the, the drawback here of these type of instruments is when somebody thinks that they're signing a term royalty deed for a small period of time, in this case, one year, and there's, you know, quote unquote, wrong language from the mineral royalty owner perspective or unfavorable language, let's say, that you're actually conveying an interest for a much longer time than you think because you don't realize what you're signing. You don't understand the language and what it means, you know, the description within that instrument, because the title at the top of any legal document really is not what they go by. They go by the language in the document itself. And so these term royalty deeds can end up lasting much longer than expected. And again, it could end up that you're conveying uh, the majority of your interests, whereas you think you're not. You think you're just giving up a small portion, maybe from a couple of existing vertical wells. 
whereas there's some specific scenarios that these uh, predatory folks are going after. And, and I think it's important, Justin, as well, to talk about some of the other scams that are out there, because this is not the only thing. This is the newest flavor of a scam that appears to be going around because they maybe have found a loophole around existing property code, or maybe people are aware of these other scams. And so they're not realizing that this is also a potential scam. Again, in and of itself, a term royalty deed is not a scam, let me say that. But if it's done in a and in, if it's done in a way that is not transparent to where you're acquiring significantly larger interest than what you're paying for, then that is what I'm calling a scam here because you're taking advantage of an unsuspecting mineral or royalty owner. I use that amount. Yeah, it's, it's using the devil in the details, you know, taking advantage of somebody who's not understanding the legal clauses that are in the document. And Matt, you mentioned some of the other scams. Episode nine, we talked about royalty leasing scams. So that's a good thing to listen to if you haven't. And then episode 219, we talked about several different types of mineral rights and royalty scams, and they come in all different forms. You know, you can go on YouTube and find videos about people talking and investing in mineral rights and royalties. And though I'm sure some are legitimate, I'm sure some are scams as well. And some of the more common scams you hear of is a finder's fee scam, which in Texas, there was legislation passed to help protect mineral owners and everybody uh, as far as unclaimed funds go. And then a royalty lease scams, which again, we talked about in episode nine. Um, and then fraudulent deeds, you know, they're, they're kind of fraught everywhere. And, and there was a huge case, Matt, with fraudulent deeds where somebody was um, assigning interest to themselves um, and just st strictly falsifying the signatures and doing the title work, which is a terrible thing that can be taken advantage of. Yeah, there was a case in Colorado, actually, where somebody did that. They forged a signature, and I think it was with respect to getting some royalties that were in suspense. And so the mineral owner found out about it. There was a lawsuit and that person actually was charged. And eventually the thing that's tricky about this is in that particular case, I believe they served probation. And then if they kept their nose clean for that five-year period or whatever it was, then that would be taken off their record. And so now they're out there again, buying in minerals and royalties under a different company name. And so these things, it's like time immemorial. There are people out there looking to take advantage to get a quick buck from those folks that they realize will not understand what is being done to them. And minerals and royalties are particularly tricky, Justin, because it's such a technical and a complex area. And so, you know, it's, I guess it's not surprising that we see this happen. You said it, man. And, you know, on that topic, I think we've all as mineral owners seen the letters that get sent out that you receive. And um, I've seen them be as intense, Matt, as a check with uh, terms printed on the back. Uh, and there's just all kinds of things that you see come in and those offer letters, you know, quite often are, are either really low ball shots, they might include deceptive language, or they might in, emit critical information related to the offer. And so it's really something where, you know, we preach that you should really never sign a lease or a legal agreement without the attorney reviewing it. But this is a perfect example of why that's so. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, you get those offers that appear too good to be true. Well, they probably are, right? So there's a reason why they are worded that way. It's to prey on that uh, trusting nature that we all tend to have in many cases. In this particular situation, we'll dive into the details, Justin, here. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. In this case, I have a couple of my colleagues that brought this to my attention where there's a certain landman based in Texas that has been making offers to royalty owners to acquire what appears to be a one-year term assignment. But when you read the language in the instrument question, it's actually appears to be a term royalty deed. Again, I am not an attorney. Don't take this as legal advice. This is uh, being provided for informational purposes only and for education. So definitely do your homework, get help from a competent attorney like Justin mentioned. But if you read the language, it appears to me and certainly all my colleagues are in the same understanding that this term assignment would really extend well beyond just the one year that I'm sure the unsuspecting mineral royalty owner thinks they're giving up. And the offer letters, they of course don't mention what actually is going to end up happening. So in particular, the offer letter says that they're pleased to present an offer of a one-year term royalty assignment. Under this assignment, you will retain your minerals and production from the excluded well bores while your minerals are subject to the assignments during its term. And then it says, we're prepared to offer you X amount of dollars. It says, execute the closed 
enclosed assignment, fill out your W-9 and return it. Once we receive those documents, we'll process payment. So it seems like, oh yeah, this is great. I'm only, I'm getting this great amount of money for only giving up a year of my royalties. Well, if it seems too good to be true, then it probably is like in this case. And in fact, when you dive into the actual examples that I've been provided, a couple of my colleagues did a deep dive into some of these. And it appears that in most cases, there are drilled and uncompleted wells, or there are, in other words, multiple new wells that are about to come online. And that had the royalty owner in question not signed to this deed or this assignment, they would have gotten a huge bump in their royalty payment. Instead, those royalties are going to this unscrupulous landman because the language in the deed says the following. It says, this grant shall run, the rights, titles, and privileges hereby granted shall extend to grantee herein and to grantee's heirs, administrators, executors, and assigns for the period of one year from the date hereof and as long thereafter as oil, gas, or other minerals or either of them is produced or mined from the lands, leases, or wells described herein, including the accepted well bore or from adjacent lands with which said lands or on lands pooled or unitized therewith in an effort to produce oil, gas, or other minerals if said operation results in the production of said minerals, then for as long as oil, gas, or other minerals are produced from said lands, adjacent lands, leases, or from lands pooled or unitized therewith. So in other words, what this is saying is there's a legal description and it says save and accept the certain well bore, you know, or maybe multiple well bores. But what this language that I just read says is, well, actually, as long as those accepted well bores keep producing oil and gas, well, this term assignment will stay in effect. Or if any other wells, you know, maybe part of a pooled unit in this case, where there's a lot of horizontal activity, by the way, then as long as those wells are producing oil and gas, then this will be in effect. So it's definitely not a one-year assignment or a one-year term royalty deed. It is something that's going to run with those wells and any future wells. So in my mind, Justin, that is very deceptive language that is used. If somebody didn't hire an attorney or didn't realize what they're signing, you know, easily could think they're only giving up a year, but in fact, they're giving up basically all of their future. Yeah, you absolutely said it, man. That there's nothing about that that says a year. It's also a huge grab because it, it, it says oil, gas, and even other minerals produced. So let's say that this was to produce lithium at some point. Uh, that absolutely could fall into this as well. And Matt, in one example, the exempted well was fairly old and shallow. And obviously they were up to something. And there was already a rig on site drilling for the prolific reservoir with five wells planned. And so really, Matt, this was just a clear way to take advantage of this uh, mineral right owner by knowing information they didn't know and that there was production being uh, built up currently. Uh, that's an amazing point. Yeah, you're spot on there. And in that case, the, my colleague who brought this to my attention, they did a quick back of the envelope calculation. And it appears that they were getting paid basically 10% of the value for 90% of the upcoming royalty. So definitely something where you need to do your homework, right? You need to understand what you own. And we'll dive into the, the takeaways and important things that all mineral and royalty owners should know. You know, regardless if you're getting an offer like this, it's just to stay on top of things and then know what you need to know and, and to know what the potential is for your interest so that when you get these types of offers, you can understand why you're getting, because there's usually a reason. So the other thing that was really interesting is the warranty clause in this was very favorable to the the landman that was, was buying this. And basically it was a, like a warranty deed as well. So if there was any like, you know, issues, then the, the, the mineral royalty owner would have to defend that and warrant that interest. And then also the indemnification clause basically says grantor agrees to indemnify and hold grantee harmless against all claims, causes of action, demands, liabilities, damages, fines, penalties, obligations, litigation, including all causes of action asserted or that could be asserted by grantor. So basically giving up all of your rights. And so I think that's how they're trying to get around, you know, someone coming back to them and saying, Hey, no, you took advantage of me. I'm going to sue you. They're going to say, sorry, Charlie you signed this indemnification language that you agreed that you were not going to go after no matter what, you know, all claims and disputes that could arise from this assignment. So it's extremely deceptive, extremely unethical 
business practices that was brought to our attention. So, you know, if you come across one of these, please let me know. We want to know what states this is happening in. You know, there's some action that's going to be taken on this to hopefully get some protections in place for these unsuspecting mineral and royalty owners to, you know, even if they do sign something like this, like in Texas, if certain language is not included within a mineral or royalty deed, then it will become null and void. But for other states, you know, that is not necessarily the case and people might be out of luck. So Justin, if you got one of these, you know, what would be the first course of action you would take? And what are the things that people should know to arm themselves with knowledge to prevent getting take advantage of by situation? You said, Matt, well, and, and, you know, seeing this, I think um, you and I, because we do know these important rules of thumbs, we would immediately be off the table. Uh, we would just kind of laugh at how bad that the um, terms of this were, how misleading it was. Uh, but that's not true for everybody. I mean, there's many people who don't even read legal contracts, much less understand what's really being said in a mineral rights world that's highly technical. And some really important rules of thumb, if you're a mineral right owner, know the differences between the types of oil and gas interest. It's really fundamental. You can't understand what it is that you're giving up without understanding what it is that you own. And that's to the next one. Know what you own. Know how much you own. Know how it got uh, split up. And and Matt, we often with operators have to give um, different lineage information to, to help them understand how the interest might have been split up. Have copies of your documents. You need your deeds, leases, division orders. Um, and then know how to find your interest on a map and see what activity is going on nearby. If this mineral owner would have known a little bit more. It could have been a good indication to them to look and see, okay, well, they do, do they know something that I don't know? And obviously they did. And then last but not least, get help from an expert when you're in over your head and get a good oil and gas attorney. Matt, even, you know, having an idea, I would never execute an oil and gas lease without having an attorney review it because there may be something going on or a scam like this going on and a clause in there that I'm just not even aware to watch for, though I feel, you know, 80% confident New things do come up, and that's the attorney's jobs to know of those. Yeah, you're definitely right there because that is where case law comes into play, and that is constantly evolving. You know, there's new cases that are decided that will change the way these instruments are interpreted. And so, you know, we can't stay on top of that if you're not an attorney. If you're an oil and gas attorney, you're in that every day, then that's where it a good attorney like that is worth their weight in gold, and especially if you have larger interests. And I will say, we understand economic reality, right? If you have a quarter of a net acre and you're approached with an oil and gas lease, and maybe you're going to get, a, I don't know, a $500 bonus check, you know, that's probably about an hour's worth of time for an oil and gas uh, attorney, and that's going to eat up all of that bonus. But on the other hand, the big upside in the future is the royalty payment. So if you're giving up rights or doing things that maybe you don't realize there are ways to do that in a cost-efficient manner, which we talked about in a few of the other episodes when we talk about negotiating an oil and gas lease, for example, we have some different strategies in there that you can use to get some legal help, but then also maybe do some of the work yourself to help save some of the money. So again, we understand the reality. If you have a very small interest, um, a lot of times it's it's a, a challenge to spend hundreds or maybe thousands of dollars to hire an attorney to have them do a thorough job of reviewing it. But there are things you can do still to make sure you understand what you're signing before you do it and use resources out there. You know, we have educational opportunities out there, whether it's in through this podcast and all the free episodes we have. I have an online course that talks about step-by-step how to do all those things that Justin mentioned we should know as informed mineral and royalty owners, you know, if you're overwhelmed, if you're just finding out that you own minerals and royalties, you don't know where to begin. I take you step by step through how to find out what you need to know in this exact you know, situation. If you're approached with an offer like this, that you can go to your state oil and gas website, you can research your property, you understand how to read legal description. You have the legal description for all your properties so that you understand what is being conveyed And then what you're potentially giving up by looking at, okay, did an operator really just recently drill multiple wells? And that's why all of a sudden I'm getting multiple unsolicited purchase offers in the mail or offers like this that appear to be a term assignment. And you can say, oh, wait a minute, I don't need to do anything. I've already in pay status on these existing vertical wells. I have five horizontal wells that were just completed. If I wait six months, my royalty checks are going to go up significantly. I just need to wait 
to get that inflow of cash. And then you can get help or you can do some work to understand, okay, how much exactly am I going to be getting? You know, what are these other wells in the area producing? And, you know, what's my interest going to be in these new wells and how much could that lead to in terms of increased royalty payments? So all of those things are important to know as a mineral and royalty owner, but are not easy. So certainly don't feel bad if you're like, I don't know where to begin. There are many other mineral and royalty owners that felt the same way when they first got started. In fact, I know, Justin, you've expressed to me that when you first found out, it was a surprise that you, your family owned mineral and royalties, right? You didn't know, like over the years, this was handed down and you had this chance to get educated by your grandparents or your, your parents. It was like all of a sudden your mom got a call out of the blue and it's like you're having to scramble to learn on the fly because all of a sudden you have a lease offer that you need to decide on, you know, right away. No, you said it. And, you know, Matt, you and I, I don't know how many times we've heard that story. It's just something that if somebody only owns one interest or even if there's larger interest, it's it's just something that doesn't get mentioned. You know, and, and the value of life is, of course, far higher than the value of these mineral rights. And it just becomes part of the estate. And with the boom and bust cycles, it can be forgotten. And then all of a sudden it comes back up again. Yeah, that's a great point. So, Matt, with this, the, the scams are not new to the oil and gas industry. It's a highly technical industry. Um, it's easy to prey on people and what they don't know. Um, and to that effect, you know, there are some um, requirements that are put out by states. Texas is a great example of requirements that they require in an effort to uh, make people realize that the document that they're executing um, is taking something from them or is a transaction, um, Matt. And this is the Texas Property Code, and it's Section 5.151. Um, and essentially, this goes through and it talks about uh, a person who mails to the owner of a mineral royalty interest an offer to purchase or a royalty interest, um, that it must be clearly printed on the document in 14-point type, style, or lodger, that by executing and delivering this instrument, you are selling all or a portion of your mineral or royalty interest in the whatever's being conveyed. And Matt, this is really an effort to try to help people understand that this document is going to last. It is not something where you need to take it lightly. Yeah, exactly. Some people don't realize they're actually selling their interest, you know, because of the deceptive practices that are out there. And to your point, it is something that this legislation was was passed because of these scams that we've talked about, in particular, the royalty lease scam. And so there's there's specific language in the Texas Property Code that someone that presents a royalty lease basically has to disclose certain things, like in that case, on that same 14-point font. It has to say on the top, this is not an oil and gas lease. You are selling all or a portion of your mineral or royalty interest. So then in that situation, somebody could say, oh, wait a minute. I didn't realize it. This I thought was a top lease. I have an existing lease and I thought they were just making me a top lease offer because of the way this thing was formatted. It looks like an oil and gas lease, but it's not. It's actually a conveyance. And so those types of things were put in place in Texas. And so Texas is the more progressive state, I would say, in some of the protections for mineral and royalty owners, but in other states, they may not have these same protections. And so if you fall prey to one of these, then you may be out of luck. And also it's important to remember statute of limitations. And so I think even if you are subject to something like this in Texas, for example, and you don't realize it until it's too late, you might be past the statute of limitations. So it is important to act quickly if you find out that you're we're taking advantage of. Don't feel embarrassed. I know many people might feel embarrassed. Don't want to tell family that they maybe were swindled. You know, get help because you may be able to get some of that or all of the money back, whether it's through litigation or, you know, maybe through help from someone like the attorney general. So, you know, certainly not acting is not a good thing. You know, take your lumps, admit that you maybe made a mistake. It definitely happens. I've made mistakes. Even I do this day to day, my day job. You know, it's it's a complex area, so don't feel bad if you get taken advantage of, but get help and, uh, you know, maybe you can, you know, find a way to, to get some of that money back or all of the money. back. You said it, Matt, and, you know, it may even be a situation where you're not the one who executed this document. It may have been an ancestor who executed this and, and fell victim to it. And, you know, there, most attorneys offer free consultations. It would be a great thing to speak with one. You may be past the, the statute of limitations, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in this case, 
for example, in Texas, we know that a couple of these that I've seen recorded in the state of Texas, they do not include that language. So if the, the royalty owner who is taken advantage of acts quickly, then it's possible that they can go after this uh, individual and get their money back. But yeah, in some, uh, some other states, you may not have that luxury. And so again, it's just, again, why it's so important to have a competent attorney help you understand what you're signing before you sign it, whether that's a deed, a lease, or any contract for that matter, even outside of oil and gas, right? There's so, you know, the, the, the law is so complex, so many nuances, language one way or the other. You may think that, you know, it's a very simple thing, but in fact, you know, for example, by including certain language, even though it may appear to be a, um, a term royalty assignment, well, if certain language is included, it may actually be a mineral deed. So you may not realize that you're actually selling your minerals. And I've talked to a few landowners that have called, you know, with a sad story of how they thought they were only um, selling a portion, but they actually sold all of it. And, you know, there's really not much you can do in many cases. So it's unfortunate. You said it, Matt. Beware and watch out for this. Buyer, in this case, it's like my friend Jimmy Wright says, the minerals and royalty space is really the only space where it's seller beware. You know, normally it's buyer beware. In this case, it's seller beware. So that's, I think, the, the takeaway here. Get help, get educated, whether it's through this show, through my course, or becoming a member of NARO, the National Association of Royalty Owners. I know that one of the topics we're going to have at our upcoming national convention in Houston, which is here in October 16th through the 19th. So definitely check that out. You can meet other like-minded mineral and royalty owners, get educated, and, and again, one of the sessions is going to be on how to avoid scam. So that great uh, informative session, I'm sure. Yep, absolutely, Matt. It sure will. And I'm glad that we were able to dive into this and kind of make people aware of it. Um, again, it's just somebody preying on on people who won't read the details or don't understand the details. And, and it's a shame to see. Absolutely. So uh, with that, thanks again for listening. And uh, we'll have links to all the resources we mentioned in the show notes, which as always can be found at mineralrightspodcast.com. And uh, again, Stay vigilant out there. Be careful whenever you are approached to sign uh, a document, get help. So thanks again, Justin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy. 